Okay, well, we're continuing on in our, our series here on Revelation. And uh, Doug, can I actually, uh, no, I wasn't chastising you. I, I, um, I was curious, so that, that uh, passage you read from your book um, it relates so directly to my sermon. I have to imagine you were looking ahead into the scripture and seeing what I was, no. you, you weren't looking for, ahead. Can, can, I, can I see the book? Yeah, okay. No, this is not planned, folks. This is. That, I, I, when you read it, I was like, well, obviously he's looking ahead. Is this where the bookmark is? Yeah. Do you mark up all your books like this as a librarian? Well, luckily. Jesus saves. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to read it again, if that's right, because it, it's, it's the perfect uh, introduction to the sermon, and it hit me so hard. I'm like, I'm just going to read that again. In desperate times, living becomes an altar where you pray and sing, because the only good news of the day is that God lives longer than you do, which is a great quote, just all by itself. If you'd only read that, I would have loved that. And God promises you that even if your days are few, your dying is not a wall, but a set of gates. Beyond this portal lies a reason to esteem your life. God stirs the ashes of your old hopes when you have faced the fact that your lifespan, like that of the Celts, is short. But your prayers endure forever. None of them die. They live in the air about us, and they move us like the breeze of Pentecost. They may appear dead, but they sometimes lay like an ember in the dull gray ash of the present moment. When the spirit, then the spirit blows, the coals flare, and the fire burns hot. I've got to read this book. That's, that's great writing and perfect for the sermon. So I'm going to read the, the passage, which is about, I mean, I think I titled it, what did I tell it? Prayers of Fire or something like that. Um, yeah, because we're talking about prayers that uh, come to fire again after Are you serious you didn't uh, that was really surprising <laughs> it's like um, yeah okay well thank you board for that introduction uh, so we're going to go ahead and read um, I'll just read it and then we'll talk about it it's the seventh uh, seal we've been going through the seals of, of, of revelation when he opened the seventh seal remember this is Jesus opening these seals there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So a dramatic, if you can imagine sitting somewhere for half an hour in silence, that's a long dramatic pause. Something, uh, something eventful again is going to occur. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So uh, the prayers and the incense are, are thrown to earth, and judgment follows. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. <coughs> the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that have become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, woe, woe to, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So 
So as the deeper we go into the book of Revelation, the more intense things get, and frankly, the darker things get. I know this isn't a typical Mother's Day sermon, so this is going to be a little darker, but uh, still relevant to mothers, I hope. Uh, um, you know, there's something, um, before I get into the details about this, there's something about preaching through Revelation, and just because I've been preaching through it, I've been having conversations with people in the church and outside the church just periodically, uh, you know, because it's on my mind, right? And so I have maybe an email conversation or something. One of the things about the book of Revelation is that it really, uh, it is adept at drawing a line in the sand, as it were, between those who, who uh, have the fullness of faith. And by the fullness of faith, I mean that their trust in Christ has a, has a, um, a finality to it, an ultimate, ultimate sense to it. And what I mean by that is there are people, I think, who do believe or tr trust in Jesus in sort, of a, in sort of a parable kind of way or a Sermon on the Mount kind of way. There are people who trust Jesus because he gives good advice. And he does. He really does give good advice. And there are people who trust Jesus because Jesus, when you follow his ways and you follow his advice, uh, things in your life be, are, tend to be blessed. And you can uh, forgive others. And your life takes on more light and, and more joy. And that's a good thing. And that's a certain, that's, that's coming to know Christ to a certain point, to a certain level. Uh, the wise rabbi, as it were, who is Jesus. And there are still people who believe in Jesus as a wise rabbi. But the book of Revelation says there's a deeper level to trusting in Jesus as Lord of heaven and earth and as one who will return to set all things right. And that only Jesus can set all things right. And so those, those people who go deep with Jesus, for lack of a better phrase, read the book of Revelation, and it is hope, and it is light, and it is good news. Whereas if you only trust in Jesus as the good advice giver, it's a little frightening, a little strange, and maybe even dangerous uh, to believe in stuff like this. Because, of course, you can look at the extremes of people who get really into prophecy and end times living, and you wouldn't necessarily look at their life and say, that's healthy living. You would necessarily see a lot of joy there. In fact, you might see a lot of anger and judgment in people who really love the book of Revelation beyond all the other books, which is also not a healthy way to know Christ. So, but it does, it, you know, I, I could go to real far down the, <laughs> the psychology of the Christian church, but there is a sense in which it's interesting to me how, uh, to me, the book of Revelation is such good news. It's so inspiring. It's so grounding. It's so beautiful. And for others, it is such an anathema. To, they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, people, everybody pretty much outside the church and even some people inside the church. So uh, just uh, thoughts I've had uh, recently with regards to the book of Revelation. So, and I, I put outlines in your uh, flyer there if you want to follow along just because it is helpful sometimes to know where we are with this but uh, we're in the trumpets section if you will the book of revelation as the book unfolds the judgments get more severe um, and this is uh, the opening of the seventh seal creates the silence and then after that these seven angels are given seven trumpets who are these seven angels well there's there is actually a, a definite pronoun i checked in the greek it's not just, and I saw seven angels who stand before God, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God. Well, we actually have seen these seven angels already, although they haven't been described in the throne room. You might remember that the first part of the book of Revelation, we spent a lot of time on these seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, remember? And each one of those letters started off to the angel of the church in Ephesus, or to the angel of the church in Thyatira, and there were seven of them. So these are angels, these seven angels who sort of represent the, the churches as a whole, or are the, the spiritual authority in those churches as a whole? Uh, that's who these seven angels are. So we've met them already, but this is the first time that the uh, book of Revelation has referred to them in this very specific way. So I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, it makes sense that these are seven angels associated with the churches, because what's happening, this is all about prayer. Another angel who had a golden censer and I thought I'd take a minute just to talk about this golden censer, too, what that is. Uh -huh. Okay, so the top two the censers are, are little bowls that you burn incense in, or large bowls, they can be. 
the top two are actually archaeological finds from uh, the Roman Empire from this roughly this time period, give or take. Uh, so you can get some sense of what a censer would have looked like in a temple. And the bottom one is uh, uh, actually it's a modern golden censer, but it gives you some sense of what a, a beautiful golden censer might have looked like. Uh, so just to give you some sense of that, that image. Uh, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. Incense, of course, always be, is pleasing to God, right? This is the, 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 what this symbolizes, something that God is uh, pleased with. With the prayers of all God's people, and that's actually in the Greek, that's holy ones, all the holy ones, the hagioi, on the golden altar in front of the throne. So you can imagine this huge censer with, with all this incense in it coming up and all the prayers of God's people in it. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Well, this is a, a beautiful image of the prayers going up before God. Surely love and joy and peace must stem from this gorgeous image of incense and the prayers of God going up to the Lord. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake, all of which prefigure judgment or symbolize judgment, if you will. So the prayers and the incense go up and uh, this darkness, if you will, falls on the earth. And that's when the seven angels who have the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And it, it's, it's sort of like the plagues of Egypt. In fact, there are some similarities. If I had more time, I could talk about that, but I won't. Um, but you know, these, these consistently horrible things for the humans on earth happen after this judgment. All this comes from this moment. The, the, you know, the book of Revelation is it's like a camera that switches forth back and forth between earth and the throne room in heaven. Worship is always happening in the throne room of heaven and these events. And then on earth in the book of Revelation, uh, usually terrible events are happening until you get to the end, of course. It's the judgment of God. So what are these prayers? What is this, what is happening here? And I, I spent some time thinking about this, and of course, I spent some time reading about it. And like so much else in Revelation, there are many points of view. Um, and the one that, that the Lord impressed upon my heart the most was, so in terms of God's judgment, we're very familiar with, and we can talk very easily about our sins, right? Or even more easily, your sins. <laughs> we can talk about the sins of the world and God's judgment on it, right? And how that was that judgment was poured out on the cross, and we we understand that it's a mystery, but we understand it. it you know, it's it's that's the uh, the core of the gospel. But there are other kinds of judgments too. On this earth, there are many prayers that people coming from a holy place, coming from a place of love. And I'm not talking just about Christians. I'm talking about people writ large. That people can can give a holy prayer from the heart when they see something evil or terrible happy and say, God, no, which is probably the quickest prayer that you can make when you see something terrible about to happen. And, and it can be ripped from the lungs of anyone. I don't care how much of an atheist you are. God, no, it's a prayer, right? I've prayed that. I can think of some God, no moments in my life. And sometimes God says, no, and it doesn't happen, whatever it is. And sometimes it happens. And these are unfulfilled prayers. The prayer is, is from the heart. It's powerful. God hears it. Nothing fades in God's memory. Nothing is, you know, he doesn't have a hard time recalling what happened 10,000 years ago. Or, you know, it's, it's just as potent for the Lord as it was, you know, at any time. And these prayers are, are, are rekindled. This is why Doug's reading was so, th these are rekindled prayers. This is how I read this. And the Lord says, now is the time of judgment. You know, since the time of Noah, God says, I'm not going to destroy the human race. I'm not going to. And because of that, he has to restrain himself so that we can survive, right? If we were all destroyed for our sin, uh, you know, we just wouldn't be around to be having this conversation right now. He restrains himself. That's good news for you. Not just the terrible people that you see out there doing the terrible things. That's good news for all of us. But because God restrains himself, terrible things happen. And sometimes you yell, God, no, and nothing happens. And this, this can be, this can be the, the biggest stumbling block between a person and faith, right? 
I remember I read Viktor Frankl's book, uh, The Meaning of Life. Search for meaning, thank you. Meaning of Life was Monty Python, which is different. <laughs> a little different. The Search for Meaning, thank you, Karen. Um, and I couldn't find it. It's a little book. It's in my library somewhere, but I, I was looking for it. I was like, I cannot find this book. Um, but I read it. I read it in college, actually, when I was uh, going to Parkland. How many of you read that book? Okay, a few of you. It's a short read. It's, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. He's not a Christian. It's not a, it's not a Christian book, but he talks about the importance of having a life that's full of meaning, which sounds really uh, intuitive, but he writes about it in a powerful way. Well, he was a Holocaust survivor. And I couldn't find the book, but I, one of the stories he told was impressed so deeply on my heart that I, I will never forget it. And it's a story of something he witnessed in the Holocaust uh, when uh, a number of children, dozens uh, of children, were taken away, taken away from their mothers. The fathers were already gone, but they're taken away from their mothers and put into a truck and driven away. You can imagine where they were being driven to. And the mothers raised a cry and a cry to the Lord of just absolute despair that as a parent, I can get behind <laughs> on this Mother's Day and any day, frankly, and the terror of that. And he said, no one could listen to that cry and think that there was a God in heaven because any God worth his salt would respond to that cry. And I don't take issue with that. I completely agree with Viktor Frankl. And the answer at that time was no, or yes, rather, to the Nazis, or however you want to say it. And those children were taken and never seen again. And that is a terrible, terrible thing when a prayer like that goes unanswered. Other prayers were answered. You can read there's Victor Frankl survived. I mean, who can say, who can weave that thread between what is answered and what isn't? But this I know, and this is why this is such good news. Those prayers will be poured out in wrath again on the earth, that judgment does come from that wrath. It is not forgotten. It does not drift out into a meaningless universe with no emphasis behind it, with no point to it. Prayers are rekindled, and they are poured out in judgment upon the earth. And it is okay to be happy about judgment. You don't want to be a judgmental person. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want to become that, that bitterness. You, you give that bitterness to God. And you say, God, I trust that you will pour this out in a way that is right and appropriate and is, fulfills all righteousness. Because we can't do it. We can't pour out that judgment. The innocent and the evil will get caught up in our little, in our, in our, we can't do it. We're not perfect enough. But God can. And so this is the good news of this, uh, of this judgment, that the prayers of God's people, the unfinished, you know, the book of Revelation is all about finishing things, covenants and, and events that, have, that only Jesus was righteous enough to fulfill. They will be finished. And I have prayers in my heart that I wanted to be answered. I know you all do. I'm not alone in this. We all have had prayers. We thought, Lord, where did that prayer go? It, it, the answer was clearly no. And it seems to me like that was a terrible thing that transpired. Surely my prayer was a righteous prayer. Surely you're a righteous God. So where's, and this, the book of Revelation is the answer to that. And if you don't believe that Jesus is coming again, if you don't believe that God will set all things right again, I don't know how you would believe in God. Because then I would have a heart, I would, I would agree with Viktor Frankl. There's another prayer that was prayer, and this, this one is pretty dark too. Um, but I, I think that the kids in the service are old enough to hear it, and the ones who are too young are just... They're not even listening to me. <laughs> um, but it struck me when I saw it. And, you know, there was a, a man who, uh, a, a hit man, and they, they made a movie about him uh, um, called The Iceman. Anybody see the movie The Iceman? Okay, well, it's not exactly a Hallmark movie. Uh, it's pretty brutal. I don't recommend it. Uh, let's put it that way. If you want to sleep well at night. But um, he, was a, he was famous for uh, offing people, shall we say. And he showed no remorse for any of his, any of his um, you can look this up later if you want. Uh, his name was Richard Kuklinski, Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman. Showed no remorse after he was caught for his murders and the terrible things he did. There was only one thing he ever showed remorse for and said he regretted. And I, I typed it up, uh, the quote here in full, so I get it right. On one occasion, Richard Kuklinski recalled 
preparing to kill a man who was begging and praying for his life. Kuklinski told the man he could have 30 minutes to pray to God and he would see if God would come and intervene. Like that 30 minutes of silence in heaven, right? 30 minutes is a long time. Kuklinski said, but God never showed up and he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. That's one thing I shouldn't have done that one. I shouldn't have done it that way, Kuklinski said. Now, it's intriguing to me. I mean, this man is clearly a psychopath. You can read about his other adventures. You know, I, why did he regret this one? I don't think he has any compassion for the man. I mean, he's a complete sociopath. I think he felt the judgment hand of God. Well, he, that is the one that fills him full because he, he murdered a faith or was attempting to murder a faith as well as a human being. And I think that scares him. That's my theory anyway, but I'll never forget that story too. That was a, a powerful one for me. So these are, the, these are the prayers. These are the answered prayers, our answered prayers that, are, that don't get answered in our lifetime, that are righteous prayers, the prayers of the holy ones. This isn't the prayer that, Lord, I'd like to have a, you know, a, a Corvette. That's not in the altar, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> Uh, you know, there, there are prayers that are just, I mean, it's fine to pray them. It's okay. If you want a Corvette, pray about it. Who else are you going to ask for a Corvette? But it's not in there. I, I don't think. I don't, maybe I. So then we get to these, uh, the trumpets. I got to wrap up here. Um, so the seven angels uh, representing the churches and the prayers of the churches, the trumpets sound. Hail, fire, mix of blood, hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So a, an environmental catastrophe writ large. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. You can read all kinds of debates online on whether or not this is a comet, a meteor, me, meteor, meteor, <laughs> not a meat eater. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thrown to the sea, a third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky, and a third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so the third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. So just basically, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these events that are destroying the earth in, in, in increments, if you will, very large increments. Um, whether these are all symbols of something or these are literal events, it's still a terrible time to be on the earth, whatever's happening. I think that we can all agree on that. One of the real interesting things, I, I didn't know this at all. This came as, uh, it's just an interesting factoid. Make of it what you will. You'll notice on the front of your uh, uh, handout there, this, this uh, picture of an angel. And I've got a picture of it up here. I just find this fascinating. So apparently there's this tradition in Chernobyl, in Ukraine, so this is, you know, pretty contemporary stuff, Chernobyl being in Ukraine. The word Chernobyl means wormwood. Um, yeah, right? So it actually means technically black herb, but they get, they get the word from the same root that this Greek word that we translate wormwood, which is a root. Um, I won't go into a whole Greek thing, but basically it's, this, it's from the same word, meaning black root or black herb, it's bitter. So that's what the, that's what in the English translations, it's translated wormwood. And in Ukrainian language, it's translated Chernobyl. And I guess there, in, in, around that area, there were, when Chernobyl was founded, there were a lot of black bushes, black uh, plants. And so that's why they named it that. And so after the disaster of Chernobyl, a local artist uh, created this shrine. This is, this is the third angel blowing the third trumpet. And there's a plaque there to commemorate uh, the poison that was spread out of the plant of Chernobyl. And so when Chernobyl happened, which was in the 80s, there were a number of people saying this is a sign of the ends of time. This is, this is one of the reasons that some people say seals one through six of, of the seals that are enrolled are things that are happening now or have already happened. And this is one of the you know, things they would point to. 
I think it's fascinating and interesting. I don't know if I believe it. Uh, it might coincide, it might just be one of those one of those things. It's a word that came from the same word, and it mean, but it is kind of a coincidence that they named their city, uh, well, Wormwood in essence, and uh, Belton is kind of a uh, third of the rivers, the springs of the name, the start, a third of the waters turn bitter. Many people die from the waters that become bitter. I mean, this is a pretty accurate description of being, I mean, the Russian troops had to hightail out of there because of the radiation levels and the radi radiation levels will be that high there for a very long time. So I don't want to make too much of that, but how could I give this sermon without at least mentioning that? Because isn't that a fun fact? Something for par tell at parties, you know? I, I, and I, I want to be clear, I take this stuff very, very seriously, but I don't know if I believe that. I mean, if I believe that's a part of the prophetic unfolding of God's will. And so I, I just, and I think it's behooves us all to hold these things very lightly, but just to say, hey, that's, isn't that interesting, right? You can say it after me. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so that's uh and then we get, okay, so at the end, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. And this is where I'm going to cut off the sermon because I do want to end early so we have time uh, for our potluck and for our, our fellowship time together. But just a reminder that as we go through these trumpets, all these things are the prayers of people, God's response in fire and judgment on prayers that have not been answered. And I think that is the good news behind this passage, behind this chapter here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll go to communion together. And if you are in a relationship with Christ, we invite you to the communion table. It's open for all. It's his table, not ours. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are holy. I thank you that your judgments are righteous. I thank you, Lord, that underlying your judgments and underlying so much of our pain is your deep and abiding love for each of us. That your hatred of sin and your hatred of death and disease comes from your deep abiding love for us. Lord, may when people see us as individuals or as a church, I pray that when they see us, they would see how your love has changed us and how your love has inspired us and given us cause to praise you even in the darkest of times. And Lord, as we go to the table, we remember that even in your darkest time, that you were faithful to your father. And Lord, you perhaps had the greatest unanswered prayer in all of history. You asked for this cup to be taken from you. And the answer was no. And you drank from the cup and we are saved. We thank you, Lord. We thank you.